In this video, we're going to have a look at the Reformation, and this is usually uh, dated 1517, and the key player in the Reformation is Martin Luther. Before we get into the details of the Reformation, it's uh, worth doing some uh, revision on the basic shape of the, the church, big sweep, uh, history stuff. So we need to start with Judaism. And we're going to see that um, we've got a, just a sort of steady uh, fragmentation uh, from Judaism. That's not to say that Judaism itself is not um, also got some divisions with it. Anyway, that's not where we are. So let's look. We start with Judaism. There we go. So Jesus, the disciples were Jews. The Bible is entirely written uh, within a Jewish context. Uh, Paul was Jewish. The gospel writers were Jewish. Um, the other letters were written by Jews. So it's totally Jewish. Um, in terms of dates, then, we need to look, at just keeping it nice and simple, death of Jesus is about 30 AD. Uh, you can't start talking about Christianity as anything separate from Judaism until about 50 AD. Uh, now, it's very crude here. To a certain extent, it's because uh, the sort of PowerPoint enables me to do easily, uh, also to simplify it. By the time you get to about 50 AD, uh, Christianity is beginning to part company. It's not this, you know, straight off at right angles as the diagram. At 50 AD, you've got people who are Christians, but not Jews. Uh, these are Gentiles uh, who have come into, they're following Jesus, uh, and therefore you can start calling them Christians. Uh, they're not Jewish, so there's um, as a division beginning there. So from 50 AD on, you can talk about Christianity. Uh, Judaism just continues, we've still got Judaism of course, today. The next date we need then is uh, just throwing Constantine here. Uh, that's when Christianity moves from being just this um, personal commitment sort of uh, religious position um, within the empire. Uh, Constantine then uh, has it as the, it then becomes the religion of the empire and gets linked in then with the political structure. So that's then. Um, We'll just call that 300. You can see the, the dates in the purple box, uh, and I kept them nice and simple there. 30 death of Jesus, 50 church starts, 300 Constantine. And the next one that we need to look at then, Great Schism, which is about a thousand. Um, Eastern Orthodox then and the West split. And that's a um, mixture of politics. Um, the, the Roman Empire and the West had gone. The Eastern Empire still existed. Um, so politically they were drifting apart, theologically they ended up drifting apart, and so you then end up with the, um, the big division then, Great Schism, uh, 1054. So you've got a nice round figure there, a thousand. Now we're, what we're interested in then is what happens to the Western tradition. So the Eastern tradition just trundles on, continues to today, and there's lots of different strands within the Eastern tradition. OK, so looking at Western tradition, then that's where we are. And then what we're interested in, then we're coming up to this point of um, early 16th century. And that's where you've got this division. And we're going to use Luther as the uh, as the kickoff point for that. And we're going to move on to the next slide uh, to look at that in a bit more detail. OK, again, very crude, very simplified. Um, we date the, the Reformation from uh, Martin Luther, uh, this 95 theses, we'll look at what those are later, and that's 1517. Um, you can't, movements like this, you can't just put a single date on them. Um, the, the date was of a specific event, the 95 theses, uh, but the, the Reformation really had begun to, to, to clearly bite by 1520, by the early 1520s, it was clearly something that was going to be significant. And one of the absolutely major factors in this was the printing press. Um, John Wycliffe had done something pretty similar to Martin Luther in England um, 100 or so years earlier, but all his stuff was handwritten uh, and it could be uh, squashed quite easily. Uh, Luther got the printing press. So, I mean, he was he, he was the equivalent of the sort of um, uh, the person on Twitter uh, of, of his day pouring out um, pamphlets. Uh, and the other factor that was very important is um, it was being translated into German. 
uh, and so it was available to everybody. It was e being spread around by the printing press and it was in German, so the vernacular, so two major uh, elements of that. In other words, it was, there was a, a media revolution going on, uh, which meant that uh, Luther's Reformation, instead of it being just a Reformation within the church, there have been loads of these uh, reformers who've turned up, um, challenged the church, they've had councils, they've had discussions, uh, they've sorted themselves out and the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church has just trundled on. Reformation that we call the Reformation uh, was different and a major factor in that was the printing press and the use of the German language. Now exactly what happened then, so we've got the, what have we got? Coming off this we've got um, Luther and that's the Lutheran tradition, we've got John Calvin, um, he's the next generation on from Luther and that's the what's normally called the re reform tradition and then you've got the Church of England um, it's quite difficult to decide what the Church of England is um, I tend to put it as the Catholic Church in England uh, whether it's Protestant or not uh, is a discussion which is beyond the syllabus um, but it's certainly not Roman Catholic uh, but if you know anything about churches you go into um uh, well you go into the cathedral and have a look at the cathedral and uh, you go into say St Osmond's uh, just opposite school and they look basically the same basically the same architecture you've got altars you've got and the, the priests dress in a very similar sort of fashion the service is um, uh, very similar and that's because the Church of England just simply became the Roman Catholic Church in England and put the services into English you go into um, a reformed church coming in that Calvinist tradition and the churches just look completely different. The architecture is different. So the placing of the Church of England um, isn't, uh, isn't particularly easy. You probably your best bet is not use the Church of England um, as an example because it is, it is quite difficult to pin down as to what it is. Uh, but it's there in the diagram um, because, well, I think it's uh, pretty important because as obviously an Anglican priest, we're a Church of England school and we've got the cathedral sitting next door. So it's worth knowing something about it. The main thing about this Protestant Reformation is its fragmentation. And you've got then coming out of that, you've got Lutheran tradition there, uh, very strong in, uh, in Germany. Um, and then it spread from Germany elsewhere. The John Calvin, you don't get Calvinist churches particularly, you get some that call themselves that, but that's the reformed tradition. Um, and you've got lots of churches today in the reformed tradition. Now, all, all that I've got there is just straight um, yellow lines coming out of that. That's not really right. It's, it's branching, they're constantly splitting. At once the, there'd been this break from the Roman Catholic Church because Luther disagreed, that then just continued. And the pattern of Protestants is they protest. They object to what's going on and then break away. And you can see this, I've, I've shown in a bit more detail in the Church of England, where the Methodism, the, the Wesleys, um, had arguments with the Church of England after their deaths. Um, they became a separate church called Methodism. Salvation Army came out of Methodism. And that's really the way that Protestantism works. It just branches and branches and branches and splits and splits and splits. So what you really need is not straight lines, but lots and lots of individual branches, which I couldn't do very easily in PowerPoint. So that's why you've got what you have. So all that yellow stuff is Protestant definitely Protestant. Um, you've got the darker green which is definitely Roman Catholic and then you've got that pale green uh, which I'm calling this the Catholic Church in England. Now the um, Council of Trent then, which is part of the syllabus, you need to know that, uh, this is when the Roman Catholic Church registered that something was going on. This was not um, what, not the way that these things normally happened. What normally happened is you had some uh, reformer come along, he um, challenged the church, the church discussed it, they had a council, they made changes to things and it was all absorbed and within the, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, they were a bit late to the table on this one because by the time they got to 1545 and thought, oh dearie me, we'd better have a council and sort this out. They, it was way, way too late. To do anything by that stage. Uh, by that stage the Church of England had become its own church, broken away, the Pope wasn't the head of the church anymore, uh, the uh, the monarch of, uh, of England was, 
And so that had, had separated you to all this straight, you know, real proper Protestantism, Lutheran and Calvinism, and then all sorts of other uh, characters came along. So by 1545, there was no way that they were going to come back into the Roman Catholic Church. It then, uh, that was it. The Western Church had fragmented and was never uh, going to return. So that's the basic shape then of what uh, we're looking at. Okay, so into the syllabus then. This is Reformation and Council of Trent, uh, Religious Life, Faith and Work. Your syllabus topics then for this, Luther's argument for justification by faith alone. And then you've got some biblical passages there which you need to read. You need to be familiar with those. Uh, Council of Trent then is a response to Luther. That's the Roman Catholic response to Luther. And then we've got this chap E.P. Sanders and the role of works in justification. And then issues for analysis and evaluation. Uh, they'll be drawn from... Um, as usual, any aspects of the content above. And so therefore you're going to get things, the extent to which both faith and works are aspects of justification, uh, the extent to which the New Testament letters support arguments for justification by faith alone. And it's that by faith alone, a uh, very important uh, component of Luther's argument. So we need to look at that in detail. Um, and we need to know what is salvation. Salvation is a key concept within this. And so we're going to have to have a look at this in some detail at what does salvation mean and what is required for salvation. There are different ways of understanding salvation. And so here, are just three models we could look at. Uh, one understanding is, is being saved is what it's all about what happens after death. And so this concept here, we're going to explore this idea of getting a ticket to get into heaven. Well, you stand a sort of cartoon stuff about turning up at the pearly gates and you've got an interview with St. Peter as to whether you're going to get in. Um, and a, an important aspect of this is avoiding hell. Now, as we're looking at the Reformation period here, um, this is something we are going to find difficult to grasp, uh, just understanding the reality that people uh, had, that idea of, of of going to hell uh, and avoiding hell. That was a potentially much bigger driving force than this getting into heaven. You know, everything was about avoiding hell. Now, if you ever get the chance, I've gone to St. Thomas's Church um, just in town, um, well, when it's open again, and um, and there there's what's called a doom painting, it's a medieval doom painting. It's worth going in and looking at it anyway. It's one of the best medieval doom paintings in the world. And as you sit and look at that, it's a picture of uh, people uh, you know, what will happen to you if you go to hell? And oh, dear me, do the people want to avoid that above anything else? And just try and, and understand how real people thought that was. So there we go. Number one, uh, being saved is about what happens. It's about after death. OK, that's one. Now, another one, uh, is salvation is about being saved now. It's about having fullness of life now, living a godly life now. Um, so sort of enjoying, experiencing, being with God now. OK, third model, then, salvation is about what happens after death and about living a godly life now. <clears throat> and the, uh, the latter is required for the former. Uh, so, you, you know, the whole package is uh, you get your godly life now. You have that sense of living with God. Um, and it's also, um, you know, salvation uh, gives you your ticket into heaven and delivers your fullness of life now. So you've got three uh, models there of salvation. And again, very uh, simplified uh, understandings. But that's this is that that's quite adequate uh, for a level. And a link to this, then, we've got this idea, is salvation, is it just one off past events? In other words, you know, at some point you become saved. Uh, that was a, an important focus of much Reformation disagreement. Or is it a multifaceted process? Is salvation something which involves uh, lots of different aspects and it, ha it happens over time, which probably is the picture given in the Bible? Now, a major focus of the Reformation is exactly what is this, to use the phrase uh, I introduced in the previous slide, this ticket to get into heaven. 
Now this can be expressed again um, rather simplistically, but it'll, you know this is um, it, this is accurate enough that it will give you a, a grasp of what's going on. And if you want to go into detail, boy, does it get really really complicated. So here we go. We've got this Roman Catholic idea, and that's generally in this discussion uh, known as works. And works is this idea of what you perform. It's things you do. It's performing all the right rituals, it's uh, the sacraments, it's saying the right words, etc. If you do all the stuff, you go to church regularly and you uh, do all the things that the church does and asks of you, then that's your ticket to get into heaven. For Protestantism, this idea of, of Luther's great cry of by faith alone is Protestants, it's faith and that's believing in the correct doctrine. So you need to get those two concepts in your head, works and faith, and works is associated with Roman Catholicism and this pure faith, faith alone by the Protestants. Now of these two, uh, the Protestant focus on faith, this is the, the more difficult uh, than the Roman Catholic concept. It's clearly got to mean more than just, uh, you know, verbal assent. You can't just um, you know, read a list of things that you believe and say, oh, there we go, that's it, I'm saved. So you've got to have something visible in the life of the person to show that their belief um, is or is not a belief. You know, if you say you believe something, but it, it you, that's a verbal assent, but there's no evidence in your life, you don't show by the way you live, you believe, then it's real questions. Say, well, do you really believe this stuff? So that's it's quite a difficult one to pin down what is meant by faith and belief. And so key questions then that uh, were asked at the time and have been asked since. How is this belief generated? Where does it come from? That's is it, you know, is it my decision to believe? Is it God's decision that I will believe? Is it God calling me to believe? Can I can I choose whether to believe? Nice package of ideas there. Um, and how does this belief manifest itself? How does it show itself to the person believing? And how does it show itself to others? How is it known? Uh, how is it known that I believe? How is it? How do I know that you believe? Now, it's different answers to these questions, which led to the Protestants then fragmenting into an ever increasing number of denominations. Now, I can't uh, overemphasize this idea that once you once you'd had the big split, once people had left the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and it's difficult for us to grasp just how significant that was, uh, because they had the Roman Catholic Church, you know, had the, 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 the sort of phrase, the keys to the kingdom. They were the ones who were the gatekeepers as to whether you were going to go into heaven or hell. And once the idea came that actually you could break away, no, you could. It was just you and your Bible and God and your own faith. Um, which came from Luther. Um, once you'd got that, then as soon as you've got a church where you get some sort of disagreements over those questions about what salvation meant, what faith meant, uh, then you disagree with the church. Well, you could just leave. You can form yourself uh, another denomination. OK, so here's a model then that we'll have a look at. I've got this basic concept which underlies much theology of salvation. It's this idea of having a debt of sin to pay. OK, so here's a uh, just picture this. You, you're, you're in debt, massively overdrawn at the bank and overspent on your credit card. Oh, none of you are in that position yet, but, you know, it's always possible for the future. So there you are. Picture yourself massively in debt, uh, overdrawn at the bank, overspent on your credit card. Here we go. Now, I don't know if you know what checks are. This might now be a bit antiquated. A grandma possibly still uses checks and grandma gives you a check drawn on the money in her bank account. So if you have that in your head, you're massively in debt and grandma gives you a check drawn on the money in her bank account to clear all your debts. Now, what we're interested in this picture is what is this check and what is the money in grandma's bank account? And as we start to engage with this picture, we'll get some uh, quite significant differences between Catholic and Protestant understandings of salvation. OK, let's start then with the Roman Catholic Church. The uh, Roman Catholic Church uh, was always in the West. 
Uh, don't forget the Orthodox Church is, is trundling along in the uh, east uh, and um, you know this is uh, it's a completely separate strand uh, but we're looking at the west here's the Roman Catholic Church and it sees itself and incredibly importantly was seen by everybody else the Roman Catholic Church were the gatekeepers to salvation. You've got this image of St. Peter holding the keys to the kingdom. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church determined whether you went to heaven, more importantly, avoided hell. Let's look then at a standard uh, picture of what people thought was uh, going to happen. And this basically is still uh, Roman Catholic theology today. Uh, not quite so simplistic, but th this is basically the, the scheme. You start off earth, earthly life, that's fair enough. Uh, we live, then the, the, uh, the, the Grim Reaper turns up and you die. Now, th this is the important bit, this salvation focused on what happens after death. And that was really, really big in the medieval period. Can't overstate how significant that was. Um, which is totally and utterly different to today. The, the, the what happens after death is not that um, big at all in the modern uh, Western church. Okay, so here we go, death. Well, what's gonna happen? Well, if you're a saint, and there aren't many of those, you go straight to heaven. That's not most people. So most people, what's gonna happen to most people? Most people are going to go via purgatory, and we'll look at purgatory later, uh, via purgatory, they'll get their sins sorted out and they will then end up in heaven. Now, crucially, uh, what you're trying to do is you're avoiding hell. You're avoiding that bottom right hand corner uh, because that's those with mortal sins. And we'll look at that in more detail later on. Um, they're the ones who are going to go into hell. Mortal sin, this requires full knowledge, complete consent. And so it's the idea here is that the person who is sinning really does. They know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly what the consequences are. And essentially, they're just giving the finger to God and saying, I'm just going to do this anyway. And so mortal sin straight to hell. Now, that image there of people sitting in torment, they're sitting in flames, but they're not going to die. And they've got demons beating them. That is literally what people thought would happen to them. And so, boy, did they really, really want to avoid that. They'd do anything to avoid uh, ending up in hell, that eternal con uh, conscious torment. Now, I'm not going to read this lot to you. This is uh, definitions of venial, venial and mortal sins. The venial ones are less <coughs> significant. They can be dealt with in purgatory. Mortal sins, you know, you've got major problems if you've uh, been involved with mortal sin. Uh, you can pause and just read that. Uh, a catechism is a list of things that you believe. Um, and this is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, which is where this extract is taken from. So if you pause this and read it, um, you don't need the details. So it is technically extension, but you might have a quick skim to get the feel of it. OK, so there's your picture of hell. I so say if you go to St. Thomas's, you look at the doom painting, then it's just this massive great uh, painting like that. I mean, personally, I, I worship in St. Thomas's quite frequently uh, and I, uh, I like to sit fairly near the front uh, so I don't have the doom painting in my line of sight uh, because it's that's what you get. And I, I can't overemphasize the reality of that for the people at the time. Uh, this was the standard view of the people um, in that Reformation period. This is what they thought would happen after death if they did not get things right. The church had the capacity to save them from this. And that, uh, say, can't overemphasize that. Incredibly difficult for us to, con uh, to comprehend it. Uh, but all I can say is that hell was as real to them as the cathedral closes to us. Um, hell was this place, well, heaven was as well, <clears throat> but they were mainly focused on, um, on hell. Uh, and it was a place of eternal conscious torment and you do anything at all to avoid ending up there. Okay, let's look then at the Roman Catholic Church and salvation 
within that context. OK, here's a, a, a schema of how you get into heaven within a Roman Catholic framework. Uh, simplified, um, not so simplified that it's it's wrong, um, but it's it's unsophisticated to say the least. But this is uh, this is the basic framework. OK, you start off, you're born with original sin and your baptism, then uh, you are baptized as early as possible. And then that deals with original sin. So that's the beginning of the process of making the person righteous. You remove uh, original sin. Then you've got a uh, next step. Then you've got um, somebody who is committing actual sins. And so you can uh, add up the number of sins that you can either see or guess from that image there. And then, OK, so how do you deal with that? You've come now committed sins. And so what you now do is you go to confession. So you go to confession, you um, confess your sins to the priest. The priest then um, gives absolution. And the idea there within that uh, picture you've got there is that as the priest forgives you, then the uh, it is Jesus, the priest, saying the words on behalf of Jesus uh, and therefore you are forgiven. Now you might be given a penance. A penance might be uh, to, uh, to to work through the rosary a few times um, and that's not trivial and superficial. It, 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 it can look as if it's, it's just a, um, a, a trivial thing. You just say the words, you know, you, you clip through your beads and you say the words and the whole point of it is supposed to be that as you go through the rosary and you say your prayers on the rosary, then you are supposed to be uh, really engaging uh, with God's forgiveness and leading uh, a better life. So you, you've got your penance, whatever it might be. Um, and then you um, that then leads to righteousness. And then um, you will end up in heaven uh, eventually, you probably go via purgatory unless you're a saint. Um, and that's an appropriate reward. And this is now using this term here, which the, the Roman Catholics don't use themselves. Um, it's an appropriate reward for good works. And so the works are the things you have done, been baptised, uh, done confession, done penance. And then uh, there's other things as well. Um, and then that will get you into heaven, probably via purgatory. That's your framework within Roman Catholicism. OK, so what we've got then, we start with Jesus, obviously it's located and, and rooted in Jesus. And so the idea is 2000 years ago, here you've got this man, Jesus, and he had the power to save, heal, nourish, strengthen people, etc. Uh, the idea here, very important, is that the powers that Jesus had then are now contained within the church, that the church now has those. And the priest is somebody who is able to be, um, how could we put this, a channel of those to the individual person. So you've got the seven sacraments. We'll look at those shortly. And this continues Jesus saving work and ministry now. Now, incredibly important is that the sacrament is an outward sign that actually conveys the grace, the gift of God that it signifies. So there's something real happening. You can see what's going on because you've got the, the sign of whatever it might be. A baptism, for example, you can see the water being poured. But very importantly, within this concept, there's something that's actually going on, that the grace of God, the gift of God um, is, um, is there's something happening in reality behind the uh, the sign uh, that is then um, influencing shaping the person and so what you've got then by the means of these outward symbols um, God is giving his divine life to anyone who wishes to embrace a relationship with uh, with him and again something which unless you are from the sort of church tradition which does this, you're going to find this difficult to, to grasp, really. Uh, the idea is that these sacraments really do have the power to to change at, at an ontological level. That means at the very, the very most basic level of, of being. 
And it's got the, the, the crucial thing here, it's got nothing to do with sort of attitude of mind of the person involved. So in other words, at baptism, the person baptized is actually changed. There is something about them which changes that the combination of the priest, the blessing of the water, the saying of the words, the pouring of the water, that person then is changed. Theologically, that is their original sin has been dealt with. The bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ. That's transubstantiation. They're no longer just bread and wine. Now, a priest is a different kind of homo sapien. Ontologically, they are different. We are, as a priest, you know, theoretically, according to the theology, I'm not just like other men. OK, so I'm different to um, uh, di different to, to a layman uh, because I have been ordained as a priest and that different. Now you can't tell, you can't, you can stick a, um, the bread and wine under a microscope, you can do the most uh, tiny uh, sort of cellular molecular uh, analysis of them, you're not going to find that change there. Uh, you know, autopsy on me um, isn't going to say that, uh, you know, that, that ah, yes, you know, Goff and, uh, and Denham, you know, they're different. You can tell at the autopsy, it's not just that Goff's a lot smaller. He's ontologically different um, to, to Denham. Uh, and that's because he's a priest. You can't tell this stuff at an autopsy. It is a theological statement. But um, again, this is something which, unless you're part of this sort of tradition, you don't get. Um, that is um, when you've got sort of step into this uh, framework, then that is how sacraments work. There is something real going on, real and powerful and profound in the way God is working. OK, Roman Catholic Church has seven sacraments, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, confession, anointing the sick, holy matrimony and holy orders. And what it means is that when these are performed it's a it's a fairly mechanical understanding that if the words are said the actions are performed then the change has actually happened it's not particularly about the the beliefs and attitudes of the people involved there is a very straightforward um i'll use the term mechanistic just so you can get the the, the uh, feel of this that saying the words, performing the actions, actually delivers what it's supposed to. God will just simply do it if it's performed correctly. OK, now we need to get into indulgences. This was a, a key trigger point in the Reformation. Uh, and indulgences, this is a way of reducing the length of time you were in purgatory. OK, and so purgatory is the, the, uh, the place you are. Uh, before you go to heaven. OK, so let's have a look then at indulgences. The indulgences are still part of Roman Catholic theology, uh, but uh, considerably more sophisticated than they were at this stage. And what had happened is by the um, by the 16th century, this whole idea of indulgences had been corrupted very significantly. And it was a key trigger uh, of the um, of Luther's work. And so the idea here is let's go back to our um, idea of, uh, of, of grandma's check dealing with your um, dealing with your debt. And so here you go. You are a sinner. Um, you've got this huge amount of sin. You've got this debt um, to deal with before you're ready for heaven. So that's centuries of suffering in purgatory and very unsophisticated concept here of, of time. Um, and, uh, you know, so was purgatory was just a, a, another place um, and, and time and everything just worked. Time and space were just exactly the same as they are on Earth. And so you have these centuries in purgatory and purgatory wasn't a particularly pleasant place because you were getting your sins dealt with. And so really people wanted to um, to reduce the amount of time uh, that you spent in purgatory. So the idea here is that um, you then got, you could just buy an indulgence and it was, it was just literally a, I'm going to say paper, but 
uh, this is 15th century, so it might have been parchment or vellum or something else, but it was just simply printed. We've got the printing press by this stage. So they were just printing these things. Um, and they, the illustration there is that's a papal indulgence printed at Westminster in 1497. And it was um, somebody wanted to raise some money. Um, and so they were selling these indulgences. And what the idea was that you bought this indulgence. So you bought it using just ordinary money. Now, if it was working properly um, the way that it should be working, the money is a symbol of how seriously the person um, wanted to, to sort out their lives. And you'd normally link it with some penance. Now, the problem was by the time you got round to um, uh, to the uh, beginning of the 16th century, you'd, you'd got to the point where, and this is what Luther objected to, it was just simply a financial transaction. And so they were just selling these things. Um, all that mattered was that you paid your money, you got your piece of paper, and the idea was that you'd turn up at the pearly gates, you'd wave your piece of paper at Peter, or you'd tell him, because you couldn't take it with you, you'd tell him you bought it, you know, he'd sort of check through the ledger, oh yeah, you've bought your bought your indulgence, right, and that's, you know, we'll, we'll knock you 50 years off your time in purgatory. And so it's, this is where it had got to. You just bought your piece of paper and the bigger you, uh, the amount of money, the longer you got off in, in, uh, in purgatory. And the idea here is the indulgence, and this is the important thing, you know, what's this, what's the bank, what's the money in the bank, this back to grandma's check. And the idea here is that the church had this sort of excess of goodness. So you've got Christ from his perfect sacrifice that put a load of money in the bank, which this could be drawn on. But then you've got the saints and they lived. They were just such good people that they could go straight to heaven. And actually they'd done more than enough to get themselves straight into heaven. So they would go into heaven. They sort of, let's put this very crudely, they sort of turn up at the pearly gates. Peter says, oh, yeah, it looks in the book. Right. OK. Uh, awesome life. You're a saint. Great stuff. Um, you know, that's, um, you know, you need 20,000 pounds to, to get in and you've got 50,000 pounds in your bank. Great. You're in. 30,000 pounds goes into this sort of into the coffers then of the church. Um, this is all symbolic stuff here, this illustration, that the church then has got this excess of, you know, 20,000 units of, of goodness. I should have used goodness instead of money. Uh, 50,000 he's got, 30,000 units of goodness goes into the bank that can then be used. And so therefore, you know, go back to grandma's check drawn on the money in her account. The indulgence is a check drawn on the account that's there because the saints have put all this extra goodness into the bank, which can then be drawn on uh, by this indulgence. So you buy it with money on earth and it's then drawn against all this uh, super goodness that was surplus to requirements to get the saint into heaven. OK, now here's your key player. This is Johann Tetzel. Um, and he really took this selling of indulgences to an extreme and he was a significant factor in triggering the uh, the Reformation because by the late Middle Ages, the, it was just a, a completely corrupt system um, and it was just uh, about raising money. People just bought these pieces of paper. Now, it's not difficult to work out what's happening. You think, OK, I'm going to commit a sin. Yeah, you know, so you go out and go get drunk and, and fornicate and then you go, yeah, if you've got money, you then just go buy your indulgence. And so the wealthy could then have this idea. It didn't really matter the way they lived because they could just use their money to buy an indulgence and that would keep them OK um, when they died. They could also have priests say masses for them um, after their death. And so you say a mass that also reduces your time in purgatory. So a completely corrupt system by this stage. And so one of the things singled out in Luther's uh, 95 Theses, uh, Luther wrote here, those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. Uh, this was a desperately corrupt practice uh, and Luther just condemned it um, explicitly. 
Uh, it was a bit unfortunate for the people who uh, really just trusted the church and were parting company with large sums of money, thinking that that was going to guarantee them salvation, uh, when of course it wasn't doing anything of the kind. And just to uh, point out that uh, indulgences are, are actually are now and always have been part of um, Roman Catholic theology. Uh, Counter-Reformation sorted that out a bit late, really. Could have done with doing that um, 50 to 100 years earlier. Um, but they're still they're still there. Uh, so you've got this one here. Uh, that's Pope Francis. And this was 2015. Um, and it was um, a, it's a, one of these jubilee years. And you could receive indulgences during that of certain praise, devo prayers, devotions or pilgrimages. So it's still part of Roman Catholic doctrine um, and always has been. But it, the crucial thing was it wasn't the, the doctrine and concept of indulgences. It was the, um, the way that they were being um, used in that period that was the problem. Although Protestants would have problems just with the very concept. Uh, but it wasn't the, the concept that uh, Luther um, was really um, focusing on. And probably if it had been, been practiced properly, he may not have even noticed. Uh, but it was he couldn't avoid noticing it because of the level of corruption in the use of indulgences uh, in his time. OK, so let's go on to the Protestants then. Here's the image, then your standard image of Luther nailing his 95 theses to the uh, the church door in Wittenberg and he's protesting because that's what Protestants do that they protest. Now the Protestant Reformation, a very complicated time, it's tied up with lots and lots of, of other factors which fed into each other um, and so generally it's dated as starting in 1517 um, with the nailing of the 95 theses to this uh, church door and then it's generally considered to have, um, have really sort of worked itself out and settled down by the end of the Thirty Years' War, 1648. So in other words, you, you think you keep this in round figures, you're looking at about 1500 to 1650, uh, because I mean, very clearly Luther didn't just sort of wake up one morning and say, oh, I'm going to go and nail 95 theses to the door, sits down, writes them and nails them. You know, this had been taking time uh, brewing and, and, and in his thinking. Um, and then, you know, the end of the Thirty Years War, uh, again, you know, it rippled on. But that's your, your period, really. It's a, 150 years uh, during which Europe was completely turned upside down. Uh, lots and lots of other things going on uh, linked to it, feeding into it. Crucially, don't forget this, this is a split within Western Christianity, the Eastern tradition, uh, was uh, completely unaffected by this. So the key concept within uh, the Protestant tradition is that they protest, that they are saying, and this is the incredibly important thing, is I'm protesting against the church authorities. I am disagreeing with the church authorities. Now that was the, the radical thing really, because up until this point, the church authorities really were the authorities. You know, they what they said went, uh, and you better listen to them because they determined whether you were gonna burn in the fires of hell or whether in fact you were going to, via purgatory, go to heaven. And the crucial concept for Protestantism then was that I could make my own decisions. Me reading the Bible, for myself, making my own interpretation and guided by my own spiritual experience, direct access to God. And of course, what that has led to is it didn't just mean that, you know, Luther broke away from the, um, uh, the Roman Catholic Church and then just formed the Lutherans. Um, what it meant then was that the, um, you know, then had Calvin, you had, uh, and once you'd got this concept of it's okay to protest, you know, these church authorities, basically, they're no different to me. Um, and I don't have to take what they're saying. Uh, the result of that is this fragmentation into thousands of different strands. Now, some of them then, uh, Church of England, again, it's this question, are the is the Church of England Protestant? Um, they obviously broke away in the sense that um, uh, that the English church, really Henry VIII said, uh, you know, I'm going to be head of the church now. Uh, but again, it's exactly the same thing. The English church said, we are not going to 
to do what Rome tells us to do. We don't need to. And so in that sense, it's Protestant because they broke away from the Church of Rome. And what they didn't do was change much. Uh, they basically just took on all the, the same um, traditions, kept those in place, put the, everything into English, uh, but mainly like, everything stayed the same. Uh, but it, it, it was Protestant in that it, it had broken away. It had said, look, you know, the Pope can't tell us what to do. Um, you know, we couldn't care less what he says. We're just going to, you know, we're not going to burn in the fires of hell just because the Pope says so. We can be our own church. And you've got so, so, some uh, Protestant or breakaway churches, pretty big, like the Church of England. And some of them, you've just got tiny groupings of people. And they're still fragmenting to this day. OK, let's get into the details then of uh, Martin Luther and uh, what led him to his... Uh, 95 Theses. So starting point is he's a, uh, he's a monk, uh, so he's an ordained priest. He's a completely 100% uh, sold out uh, Roman Catholic, uh, very devout. Um, and that crucially, what he's doing, he's doing everything that he possibly can, everything he's supposed to do uh, to be a godly man. You know, what else is he supposed to do? But existentially he feels far away from God, feels in despair. Uh, smart chap this, you know, he's been reading the Bible, that, uh, not only in the, the Latin, which had been his usual, uh, but he's also been reading it in the Greek. Now, that's incredibly significant that at this period, um, Greek, uh, the original Greek of the Bible was becoming available uh, in the West. Um, and that was, um, opening up uh, questions for people who were reading it in the Greek um, because they were seeing things that actually weren't in the original. So the Latin that they were using was a translation. The Greek's the original. And so that was uh, quite challenging. So Luther's there reading his Greek text, seeing things which he think he could recognize as shoddy translations in the Latin. And, and very particularly, uh, this is leading him to, to focus on the sale of indulgences. And so where he ends up with this is this uh, great cry of, the, uh, of Martin Luther and the Reformation, this idea that salvation is sola fide, by faith alone. OK, so we've got then sola fide, justification by faith alone. Um, justification is this uh, is a crucial component within this concept of salvation. We go right back to the beginning, what we're saying there, salvation, a central concept here, and justification by faith alone is Martin Luther's great cry within that discussion. Now, one of the things about Luther is very important is that he's working primarily with the writings of St. Paul to challenge the Roman Catholic model. Um, now, as a, a critique of that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to, to work with the Bible, you work with the Bible in its entirety, set within church tradition. And the, uh, the, the more you focus down on one section, uh, the more uh, you are likely to find yourself going off at tangents. And so I, th that would be my analysis, that Luther here is focused primarily on the writings of St. Paul. Now, as unquestionably, uh, you can challenge Roman Catholic model from St. Paul quite validly. Um, but to get a complete perspective, uh, you need to work outside of just the writings of St. Paul. So let's get into some texts then. Uh, so there's your Romans 1.17. And the important bit here is for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. As we look at the Bible texts here, you'll see that the, uh, there's a common theme and it's all about uh, this idea of faith. Again, we're in Romans, therefore, since a crucial phrase here, we are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm not going to read through all of these. You can just pause the uh, uh, the video and read uh, yourself for the uh, the context for these. We're now in Galatians. It's still in uh, Paul's letters. Uh, yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but 
through faith in Jesus Christ. And that tension um, of faith versus works is absolutely central to Luther. And so what we've got here is this idea, are we justified by the works of the law? Um, and, and then Luther translates that into um, the, uh, the Roman Catholic practices of the time or justified through faith in Jesus Christ. And Ephesians, again, Pauline epistle, a God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, at dead through trespasses, grace you have been saved. So it's the gift of God in grace. Uh, then we move down to the green bit. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing, a gift of God, not the result of works. OK, and then the last bit created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Absolutely central passage, which is raising lots of um, really important issues which were at the heart of this Reformation discussion. And so we've got sola gratia, that's grace alone, that free gift of God. And then the standard interpretation of this from the Protestants is that works, uh, which is what we're not saved by, works equals all the rituals and practices which the Roman Catholic Church requires for salvation. So, of course, you've got a step here of interpretation. Um, Paul is writing, this is obviously uh, in English here, um, what we're using the word works. And then Luther is saying, right, OK, so what he's saying is that that's not the rituals and practices of the Roman Catholic Church. It's something else. It's faith. It's our faith and it's grace. Grace is the gift of God and it's this sort of undeserved uh, gift of God that saves us, which we have by faith in Christ. OK, now Luther had a bit of a problem here because, of course, as soon as he started reading outside of, of Paul, very selective in what he's reading, he then comes a, across the letter of James. There's your syllabus bit here. Um, Luther's rejection of the letter of James. Luther hated the, um, the uh, letter of James. This was a letter written by James, brother of Jesus, uh, so not written by Paul. And he referred to it as the epistle of straw. OK, so what we got here then, why does uh, Luther hate uh, the epistle of James? Because James writes here, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? Now, of course, it's completely contrary to the line that Luther wants to take. And so then verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, the obvious thing to do here is you've, you've got to interpret the Bible against each other. It's a book, a collection of writings in dialogue with itself. Uh, and you, you know, you're really going to come unstuck if you decide you're going to focus in just on Paul and very particularly on Romans. That's a really important one. And then you come across another bit of the Bible and you say, no, this disagrees with Paul. I'm going to reject it. And so here we've got this central issue here. What does James mean by works? Absolutely essential uh, concept in this whole discussion. And so there we go. You need to have a look at that. Make sure you've grasped this. Why does Luther dislike the letter of James? So we need to have a look now at this idea of saved by faith alone, uh, or saved by works, or saved by faith and works. And so what we're exploring then is this is justification and hence salvation. Is it earned or deserved because of what a person has done? That's the works model. In other words, let's put it rather crudely, you know, back in your, your um, uh, sort of cartoon things, you know, you turn up at the pearly gates and you say, right, you're going to let me in. St. Peter says, why? And you then just sort of reel off all the list of things that you have done. You've always been to mass. You've been baptized. You've had your, you know, your confession and absolution. Um, you know, you've just done everything. All that you've ticked all the boxes of what the Roman Catholic Church says you should do. OK, there's another model there. 
It's simply imputed by God, zero contribution from the person involved. And so this is a faith model that the person has faith and then that righteousness um, is, is just sort of given as a gift, uh, grace from God. Or oh, third model, some combination of faith and works. OK, the semantics then, this is where it uh, becomes a bit of a problem. Faith in this context, that means essentially a contemporary normal usage, really. And so we've got this idea of faith is a it's a belief. It's a, an assertion that you uh, you um, say something is a powerfully held belief. And so it's something uh, for the better term, something in the mind. Um, and, you know, what does somebody have faith in? To a certain extent, they can tell you um, there, there's got to be a link. And this is a, one of the discussions here, a link between what you say you believe what you say you've got your faith in and the way you live. And so that's a question within the Protestant uh, sphere. Now, works, this is a major problem because it just doesn't have any contemporary normal usage. And so this use of the word works here, it's a purely technical uh, discussion and it's purely within uh, Re Reformation theology. This is a, uh, essentially a reformed uh, technical term. Um, and it's something a person does. It's an action and it's uh, about following rules and rituals. And so what we've got then is, is this works then. It's, it's something external to the person. Uh, someone was just saved by, you just go through the list. Oh, I've been baptised. OK, you take the bread and wine at mass um, or merely be present as the sacrifice is enacted you go through the rosaries of penance you know all the other sacraments you've done them all you tick the boxes now it's very easy here to have a sort of very mechanistic approach um you you know you go through you follow all the, the laws the rituals and the practices of the catholic church you'll then be allowed into heaven because you know all these are ticked off in the book of life now there is the doctrine of the way that the the sacraments work within the Roman Catholic Church does lean in a mechanistic type direction. And so therefore, it's not surprising that this can be seen in this mechanistic approach. There is a sense in which, you know, the priest, if the priest stands behind the altar and says the right words, if they are a correctly ordained priest and they say the correct words and perform the correct rituals, that bread and wine then simply becomes the body and blood of Christ, transubstantiation. It just does. Completely irrelevant what the heart and mind of that priest is, completely irrelevant what the heart and mind of the congregation is. The, the body and blood of Christ given to those people that will actually uh, affect a change. So Roman, straight down the line, Roman Catholic theology leans in that uh, rather mechanistic direction. Now, Protestants then, they're more interested in what you might call the internal, it's heart and mind stuff, it's stuff you can't see. Uh, and so this is, the, here's your tension. Um, is salvation about what you are doing, the visible, the rituals and practices, or is it about this internal heart and mind. To get into this, we need a bit of uh, Jewish background. Now we'll look at this in a bit more detail um, with E.P. Sanders later. Um, but we need to, to try to get hold of what might be meant by works, what we use in the English word works here, in Paul and James, which is what Luther was working from. OK, so let's get into uh, a bit of Judaism. The Jews were Jews by following the Jewish law. That shows that they were Jews. It's what separated them from the Gentiles. It's what still separates them from the Gentiles. Now, there aren't many Jews in Wiltshire. Um, I grew up in Manchester, so I knew lots of Jews. There were Jews, Jewish boys at my school. I lived in a Jewish community and the Jews kept the Jewish law, which made them different. They uh, have their food laws, you know, the kosher food laws, the animal must be killed in a certain way. You've got nothing from a pig uh, you, for the uh, rules about mixing meat and milk in the same meal. Uh, so the, uh, the strict Jews keep a kosher kitchen. Uh, you've then got these complex rules for Sabbath. Shabbat uh, runs from a Friday evening to a Saturday evening. So in the, the winter, the boys 
Um, the boys in my school had to go home early, miss last period on a Friday, uh, so they could get home before sundown uh, when Sabbath started. And then you've got all these um, different rules, different uh, details within this. The basic concept is do no work. Um, and so you can't, uh, and, and all these details were then put in. You've got the Sabbath walks back just short of a thousand metres. So Jews live in communities, about a thousand metre circle around the synagogue. Uh, you can't carry things beyond a certain distance. You can't write or erase. Uh, you can't do business transactions. You can't drive or travel. Some of these, of course, had to be added in um, because obviously there were no cars when these laws were drawn up. You can't shop. You can't open your shop. Uh, live in a Jewish community and just Jewish bread shop it's a bit of a pain because they don't open on a Saturday you know you can't use a phone you can't turn on or off anything which uses electricity and you look at uh, Jesus was quite critical of the, the way the Pharisees had developed the the Jewish law into this list of really very finely detailed um, prescriptive things that you can and cannot and must and must not do as part of this idea of the Jewish law. This is the background that Paul and James were talking about when they were discussing salvation. It was entirely within a Jewish context, uh, which then Luther is translating into a Roman Catholic context. And so as, as we're in that period of the formation of the church going right back to that first diagram uh, you've got uh, the whole of christianity is a jewish concept jesus the disciples the people who wrote the new testament are all jewish and as the church formed initially they were just all jews and then people who were not jews started to be drawn to jesus and so you've got the um, you've got Jesus execution uh, around 30 AD. You've then got the resurrection event, which we won't go into details of what that is now, but there was certainly something happened. Um, and then people get drawn in. This is all a Jewish context. But you've then got those later who or by about 50, you've certainly got um, plenty of people in the church who were not coming from a Jewish background. And so those epistles that what Paul was writing about, what James was writing about, the context for that was these original Jewish followers of Jesus wrestling with this question. When Gentiles become followers of Jesus, do they have to follow the Jewish law? Do they have to give up bacon sandwiches and get circumcised? Or, in fact, they can they continue eating bacon sandwiches and remain uncircumcised and be followers of Jesus? Now, these weren't simple questions. These were absolutely central. And you see this being wrestled with um, as you read those epistles. Now, the, con the basic conclusion that they came to was that actually, no, these Gentiles do not have to become Jews in order to be a member of the church and a follower of Jesus. The decision was, no, you can keep eating bacon sandwiches and you don't have to get circumcised, which was pretty good news for those Gentiles who wanted to join the church. OK, so we try and move then, if we put Christianity into a Jewish context and move from Judaism into Christianity then you can fairly straightforwardly summarise uh, Christianity into Jesus' summary of the Jewish law. Now, bear in mind, this is the Jewish law. Uh, you know, the here we go. You, know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. That's out of the Old Testament. That is just straight Jewish teaching. But what we've got then is a far more complex answer has got to wrestle with what's the totality of the meaning of the Jewish law, not the, the sort of nitpicking details about, uh, you know, what you how you sort out your kosher kitchen and separating your milk and meat. Um, what does it mean to be a Jew? How do you define being a Jew? And then the for the Christians, then it was this, well, how much of this Jewishness, how much of this Jewish law in detail or in spirit is to be taken into Christianity? And how is this the Jewish background, the whole of that Old Testament background? How is that going to be taken into the into Christianity, into the church? And how will it show itself in that new context? 
So as we move then into the, the Reformation period, that what you've then got is over time, the, the Western tradition, you could say the same for the East, but say we're just forgetting the Orthodox tradition for this at the moment. So the Western tradition had built up this uh, various laws and ritual practices. And OK, well, how are these to be understood? Are they an essential part of being a Christian and therefore salvation? Or are these rituals and laws seen as producing salvation in themselves simply by doing them? That's this very mechanistic understanding of what's going on. So that's a tension you've got. Now, what the reformers saw, and when you consider what the Roman Catholic Church was like at the time of the Reformation, not difficult to see why. What the reformers saw was in the church, they saw just a straightforward return to the situation of the Jews at the time of Jesus. The Jewish establishment were just absolutely fanatical. The, the Pharisees uh, were fanatical about keeping the Jewish law to the tiniest detail and obsessed with ritual purity. Parable of the Good Samaritan, that's not only saying love your enemy, it was also a really biting criticism of the, the those pious Jewish officials who the reason they walked past the injured man is because they were more bothered about keeping their uh, ritual purity than they were about care for a fellow human being. And so the, the, what uh, the, the, the reformers were wrestling with was how much could you look at the Roman Catholic Church and say, look, we've now got exactly the same situation as the Pharisees that Jesus was so um, condemnatory of. And therefore, you know, a reform, just as Jesus reformed Judaism, a reform is now needed and get away from this following of laws and rituals. And so we've got the argument then starting with Luther and then it picks up with other reformers and the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And it's all about back to salvation. This is it. What is salvation? Uh, what produces salvation? And is salvation a faith issue? Is it a heart and mind issue? Something essentially, you know, internal in the mind? Or is it a works issue that's performing external rituals, following of laws? Now, you know, this then is fairly obviously, it looks like a bit of a, a rerun of that first century discussion about following the Jewish law or uh, now, of course, this is where it gets vague. You know, what does it mean to be a disciple of the risen Christ? Now, fairly obviously, as you read the epistles, you can see those um, uh, first century uh, Christian thinkers wrestling with this idea of, you know, the Jewish law. Which, what, what is it that's got to be kept? What of Judaism is brought over into Christianity and what is going to be rejected? And so that's then, um, and that then has to be, that's not straightforward in itself. There's some bits which are straightforward. And then what Luther and the others are doing is translating that discussion into this um, discussion within the medieval Roman Catholic Church. OK, let's look then at what salvation uh, means within a Protestant context, this idea of salvation by faith. Key concepts here are saved by faith alone, that's sola fide, okay? And, and it means alone, that's all you need. Justification is just entirely, it's a gift of God. Uh, sinners are not saved in any way at all by works, by something that they've done. It's an absolute dependence on God's promise of forgiveness. And God makes them righteous just by declaring them righteous. OK, here's our uh, model of salvation, Protestant model, uh, which is contrast with the, uh, the Roman Catholic one that we did earlier. Now, the major problem with this is it's actually quite far more complex because there's um, it, it's just more conceptual. That Roman Catholic one is um, in many ways fairly straightforward um, in that it's, it's sort of visible because it's that uh, what Luther called a works model 
uh, the sacraments are very visible things. And don't forget, in the Roman Catholic model, uh, there's a, a, a leaning in the direction of it being seen uh, rather mechanistically. This is just entirely conceptual. So what we've got then, uh, we've got grace, a gift of God. So what you've got then, this is the outpouring of love of God to all people. So this is an action from God towards humans, which is on merited so it's the idea of god so loved the world that he gave his son okay so you've got that gift from god okay so what does that do well that produces faith the faith is what a person has in response to the gift of grace now the here's the first problem well how much of this um is a choice can we make a decision to receive or to reject the grace, this gift of God, or in fact, is it the question that God has chosen us? And if God has chosen us, if we are one of the elect, then we will just simply have that faith. OK, I'm not going to go into that in detail here. Uh, that's done elsewhere in the syllabus. OK, but again, not straightforward. OK, so what happens after faith? Faith then gives us salvation. OK, the person then is declared righteous by God. It is a gift of God. Um, the person being saved, they've not in any way earned it. They don't deserve it by what they have done. It's a free gift. OK, what's going to happen next? Well, once the person is saved, they then you would expect them to be doing good deeds, which could be seen as this idea of works. In other words, this is what a person does because they have faith in God because they have salvation. Very importantly, it does not in any way, shape or form contribute to their salvation. So there's your schema for the Protestant model. And another diagram to um, see if this helps make sense of it. You've got man and God is bridging the gap between those two. And so what you've got here is our sin is imputed to God. God uh, takes on that sin and <clears throat> God's righteousness is imputed to us. And here are the five solas defined um, at the time of the Reformation. These are absolutely central to Luther's project. We've got sola scriptura, which is scripture alone. Um, he wasn't big on tradition at all. Uh, he wanted to say, no, it's just me and the Bible. Sola Christus, that's Christ alone. There's nothing else at all. It's me <clears throat> and engaging with the scriptures, which enables me to engage with Christ. Uh, sola Gratia, grace alone. It is only grace. There's nothing about me. No works, no actions of mine are going to contribute to my salvation. Sola Fide, faith alone. And Sola Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. And so those are the, um, the five key rallying cries of the uh, of Luther and that Lutheran Reformation, which then continued into the other Protestant traditions. OK, Council of Trent, it eventually dawned on the Roman Catholic hierarchy that this was rather big. Uh, this wasn't just some little spat. Um, this wasn't going away and it was something, oh dearie me, which looks like we can't deal with it uh, like other um, of these reforming movements and just deal with it internally. So anyway, eventually they got their act together. Uh, Council of Trent, this is Northern Italy, not the East Midlands. And it was 1545 before they started sitting in this council. So the Council of Trent, also known Counter-Reformation, what they got to do here, they had to answer the, the, the challenges of the reformers. Um, huge amount of rethinking. They had to uh, work out what they actually believed, if there was anything that was uh, was valid being said. And you really, with this Counter-Reformation, it goes from the Council of Trent, that's um, that period, 1545 to 1563, but it then runs up to uh, this thing called the Patent of Toleration. So really what you've got is mid-16th century to, um, you know, end of 
the 18th century, which is this period of very significant rethinking and reordering in the Roman Catholic Church in order to preserve um, well, to preserve the Roman Catholic Church, um, to preserve its power, influence and wealth, um, and to also to answer the theological challenges of the Reformation. So it was both political and theological. And don't forget in this period, uh, separating out the theological and the political that wasn't as simple uh, as it would be today. There's five major strands within the Counter-Reformation. A defence of Catholic sacramental practice, that's to say those seven sacraments, uh, they are going to stand. Uh, you know, the Mass is what it is. You know, it is something real going on. You know, the, if you've got a correctly ordained priest and he says the correct words and performs the correct ritual, that bread and wine really does become uh, the body and blood of Christ, uh, transubstantiation, and when given to the people, uh, it will affect change. So, uh, and same with the other uh, sacraments as well. Um, all the church standard ecclesiastical and structural reconfiguration, it was all rethought, solidified at religious orders. That's the monastic uh, communities. They were uh, shaken up, some new ones were formed. There was quite a, a revival um, and some uh, key movements started, which were very uh, significant. Uh, there was a, a revival in, of spirituality, some of it linked to religious orders, and there were clearly political dimensions to it as well. Unsurprisingly, quite a few of the things that they decided were just very directly uh, aimed at the reformers. So here's a, uh, one of the canons then. If anyone says that no one is truly justified, but he who believes himself justified, and that by this faith alone, absolution and justification are affected, let him be anathema. Now that's the Roman Catholic Church saying that this person is formally excommunicated from the church. Now, of course, that used to be a really big deal because if you were declared anathema, that meant you were going to hell. Now, of course, by the time you get around to the uh, the Council of Trent, uh, the Protestants, quite honestly, they couldn't care less um, what the Council of Trent said because they had already parted company with the Roman Catholic Church. But you can see that that one, and there were others as well, is just very directly going head to head with uh, Luther's theology. The Council of Trent, then, is the, is the most important bit of this uh, overall Catholic Counter-Reformation. Um, and as I say, they eventually got their act together and decided they ought to reply to Luther and the reformers. Um, it's mainly Catholic bishops. It's the standard um, sort of council where you get the, the, the senior clerics to meet together. And it was uh, ran for a period of 18 years. That's the way these councils tend to operate. The primary purpose was just to direct head to head uh, saying that these uh, reformers, Luther, Calvin, etc., were just wrong um, and to anathematize them. Um, but in the process, what it did, it clarified the doctrines and practices of the Catholic Church. They had to rethink of um, a rethink and reorder. Um, and, and, you know, if even if they decided they were going to stay exactly the same, which in the main they did, uh, they had uh, clarified and thought and codified um, clearly what the Roman Catholic Church believe. And so just to run through some of the main teachings, um, again, this one's just head to head with Luther. Uh, if anyone saith that the justice received is not preserved and also increased before God through good works, but that said works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not a cause of the increase thereof, let him be anathema. And so that again is, is you know, saying that all these Protestants um, are outside the church, and as far as the Roman Catholics were concerned, meant that they would burn in the fires of hell. Um, and it's saying here that, you know, just head to head. No, it's about works. It's about going through the rules, the rituals, the uh, using the sacraments, that that is essential for salvation. Now, the place of the Apocrypha, let's think about the, the biblical canon here. Uh, you've got the basic biblical canon that everybody agrees on, which is the 66 different writings. But then you've got other works as well. The Apocrypha, most of these sit between the end of, of the standard Old Testament and the beginning of the, the New Testament. Now, these are absolutely essential within uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church and they're contained 
the the Latin Vulgate. Uh, the Vulgate Bible is, is absolutely central to Roman Catholic doctrine. Um, and the, the Apocrypha was needed because there were plenty of Catholic doctrines, purgatory prayers for the dead, salvation by works. They're found in the Apocrypha. And so therefore it was essential that this was included as part of the canon. And so likewise, um, you know, if you uh, rejected that, uh, rejected the, um, the, the Vulgate, you know, again, surprise, surprise, you are anathema. Uh, transubstantiation, completely rejected by the reformers and reaffirmed um, by the Council of Trent. Sola Scriptura was rejected because the within Roman Catholic teaching, uh, there are two sources of special revelation. You've got Holy Scripture. Now, of course, that is uh, wider than the Protestants because you've got uh, as the, um, the the Apocrypha is there as well because they're working with uh, the Vulgate. Um, but also, as the two sources of revelation, scripture and tradition, and including unwritten traditions. And so that was, uh, again, a major source of conflict with the reformers. The reformers actually were distinctly naive to think that they were just using scripture and that somehow they had this sort of complete sort of clean room approach where they were just, they in a purity of, of thinking could come to scripture um, and just get from scripture what was there. Uh, they were uh, incredibly naive to think that they were reading the scriptures uh, somehow outside of um, a, a worldview shaped by a whole stack of different uh, sources. Um, anyway, the Council of Trent, this is uh, explicit a challenge to sola scriptura. Indulgences uh, were reformed. Um, but they were they were retained. As I said they've still got indulgences today, but in a much cleaned up fashion. Uh, doctrine, of pur doctrine of purgatory uh, was um, was reaffirmed. And again, you know, if you um, if you want to reject the doctrine of purgatory, surprise, surprise, you know, you are again um, you are uh, anathematized. Now we need to have a look at this Vulgate translation of the Bible. Uh, this was a translation uh, from this chap Jerome um, and it was late 4th century. Let's do some quick revision on the, um, the Bible in its languages. New Testament originally written in Greek because that was the international language for the writers so that would maximise the number of people who could understand it. Now the Eastern tradition, the Orthodox, um, they just worked in, in the Greek text so that Eastern part of the empire uh, worked in Greek, no problem. When the church spread north and west through the Roman Empire, uh, produced a Latin translation because that was the international language of the Western Empire, again to maximise the number of people who could um, who could understand it. Of course, when the uh, Western Empire collapsed, um, the the Roman influence uh, plummeted. Uh, Latin no longer was the language of trade and. Um, and no longer an international language, it was purely the, used by the church. Uh, but the uh, Roman Catholic Church hung on to the Latin translation. One of the reasons for this was that the, um, the Latin wording, so the specific wording of the Vulgate translation, generated some uh, central uh, Roman Catholic doctrines. And in fact, it was a capital offence to translate the Bible into the vernacular. So when, for example, John Wycliffe um, in the um, uh, 14th century translated the Bible into English, um, he was risking his life in doing so. And Jan Hus, who uh, went to Bohemia and, um, and translated the Bible there into the vernacular, he was in fact executed. Uh, Wycliffe uh, conveniently died before they could execute him. Um, and one of the first things that, that Luther did um, was to translate the Bible into German. And this was a key element of the Reformation. And one of the reasons for this concern with the, the Bible and translating it into the vernacular and also challenges to the Roman Catholic doctrine was the um, availability of the Greek text in the West. And this was brought about by the um, conquest in Constantinople 1453 by Islamic armies and what that meant was there was this all these eastern scholars 
that came into into Europe, bringing with them Greek texts of the New Testament and also uh, ability to work with Greek, with Latin. And so what you've then got is instead of everybody just using the Vulgate Latin translation, uh, suddenly there was uh, an alternative uh, reading. And in fact, uh, a more original, well, the original reading, uh, the, the Latin was the translation. It's very challenging for uh, the Roman Catholic Church and was uh, incredibly important for uh, the reformers. And just a few uh, bits of detailed stuff. You can uh, ignore this if you want to. This is an extension. Uh, but for example, you've got in the um, this justificare, which is Latin from the Vulgate, which means to make righteous. Now, it's a technical word within the Roman legal system. So how is an unrighteous fallen sinner able to be made righteous? Now, the Greek original, um, which is uh, dikaisunai, um, is to declare righteous, which isn't the same thing. One is making righteous and the other one, the original actually, really means to declare righteous. Now in this one here, we're looking at the word repent. So that's the word used in the, the NRSV, repent and believe the good news. Now th today, this is a technical Christian term. It's never used uh, outside of that context. Uh, the CEV, which is a, a paraphrase, paraphrase type translation, has it as turn back to God and believe the good news, turn back to God. Now that's a, a very general sort of way, which is certainly the way I've always understood repent. If you look at the Vulgate, then what you've got there is this word poeni temini. Now what you've got there with that word, that Latin word makes a very clear link with the Roman Catholic practice of penance. So embedded within the Vulgate, you've got this idea that that means to do penance and believe the good news, whereas in fact that's not included in the original, uh, the original being the Greek, uh, metanoiete, um, which is straightforward normal usage term just to change one's mind or purpose. So that wasn't a technical term at all in the Greek. It's just, you know, change your mind which is you know, really um, probably pretty good for the, the CEV actually, um, turn back to God, change your mind, turn to God, believe the good news. Uh, the term repent, it tends to be used uh, despite the fact that's not actually a word that's used outside the Bible. So what you've got here is a very clear example of the incredible importance of the Vulgate because embedded within the Vulgate, are some key Roman Catholic uh, doctrines, which if you then um, go to the Greek and just do a modern, uh, you know, straightforward, accurate translation, it can be a profound challenge to some of those doctrines.